We're back today with Paul McKenna talking about his life and career and phenomenal success in the world of hypnotism. And now he's an international star, having had massive TV success in America. He's just flown over there to record a brand new series on a two year contract. I first came across Paul McKenna during his weight loss book. And a side of me with him being a TV personality hypnotist wondered whether it was just hocus pocus. Seems to work for a lot of people, though. Paul McKenna, is your stuff just smoke and mirrors? Well, the evidence is the research research is pretty much in my favor. Um, we did a research study, uh, actually not us, but um, a, an independent company did recently, and it showed that my weight loss system has a 71% success rate. Now that's seven times more than any diet. That's seven times better than any diet in the world. So right now your best chance of losing weight is with my system. And that's not me saying that's an independently verified um, uh, study, which, which, is, which was done uh, over a period of time on the system. So I mean, right now, if this was a drug, you know, I could take this to a drug company for a billion dollars but it's not the delivery system is through books and seminars and cds but it works it doesn't work for everyone but it works for most people most of the time and i tell you that's a lot better than diets because diets work for less than 10 percent of people 91 percent of dieters fail diets are rubbish diets are a con i don't know why anyone would do a diet i suppose what happens is you know, people think to themselves, oh, I really better lose some weight. I know I'll go and get that book by that person on TV or that video, that DVD. Now, the people that uh, are probably least qualified to tell you how to lose weight are the ones making the most money from it at the moment. Just because someone's rather good looking and they read auto cue on television doesn't mean that they know anything about human behavior. Weight loss is about changing human behavior. Just because someone's a nutritionist, what the hell do they know about human behavior? If you want to lose weight and you want to keep the weight off, you have to change your relationship to food. Now, I don't care if you've been overweight all your life, if all your family's overweight. I don't mind if you're a late night snacker, a binge eater, if you can't seem to just shift those last 10 pounds, my system will work for you. It works for nearly everyone, nearly all the time. And I tell you, nothing else works that well. Let's start at the beginning then. When did you become Paul McKenna the hypnotist? When did you become the man that wanted to have the power over the people? Well, I used to do what you do. I would. I was a local radio broadcaster and quite happy doing that. And I was interested in yoga and meditation. And one day I went to interview the local hypnotist and I was feeling particularly stressed that day. I used to do yoga and you know meditation all the time. But I was having a right old stressful day. And I said to the guy, go on then, do your weirdy mind thing on me. And I was amazed at how relaxed I felt and actually quite euphoric afterwards. I, I felt quite quite astounded by how good it was. So I borrowed some books from this guy and began hypnotizing my friends to help them lose weight and quit smoking. And it worked pretty much, you know, each time. And then the inevitable thing would happen. I'd be at a party and everyone would say, oh, make Fred think he's a kangaroo, you know, or a washing machine or something. And we'd all fall about laughing. And so it kind of took off from there. I, 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 from there, I thought to myself, wow, you know, hypnosis is a great party trick. It's, it's very... Uh, it's very powerful for helping people improve their lives. But the way to demonstrate it to people is through the entertainment format. So I carried on doing the two jobs for a while. I was a radio broadcaster during the day and a hypnotist entertainer by night. But um, my, my, I suppose my main passion was the self-improvement side of it. And um, I eventually uh, landed a television show. Um, this will be back in the like, early 90s, about 10 years ago. And um, I you know, would do this um, on television, go out at night and do shows. But during the day, I would do seminars, make tapes and CDs, that kind of thing, to help people. And um, I suppose my life has, has, has changed direction over the years. And I've been taken more in the direction of the self-improvement. Even though I've done that all the time, that's what people, I suppose, know me for better these days. Whereas 10 years ago, everyone said, oh, it's the man who makes, you know, a man think that a broom is his favorite supermodel and snog it. Whereas nowadays, people know me for the books. Hypnotism is fascinating. It's banned in this country in theatres. Some people believe it's evil. Some people believe it's black magic. I want to talk to you about the extremes to which people will go under your control. Do you think you could make somebody do something illegal or even kill somebody whilst hypnotized? OK, well, it's a good question. Um, there were a number of people about 10 years ago when I you know, was regularly doing entertainment shows on television who claimed that you know, they were down at the police station the next day looking for their invisible leprechaun or you know, that they thought the washing machine was um, sexually attractive or some you know, kind of mad stuff like this. And the government appointed 
a panel of very eminent um, psychologists and psychiatrists to look into these claims made by people. And I'm afraid to, to report back that they rubbished every single one of them. Not one of them, not even one of them had any validity. Now, I've seen these stories repeated from time to time. But, you know, the truth is very simple. Hypno hypnosis is not not in the slightest bit dangerous, not one tiny little bit. Now, what you do have is that sometimes um, people who are vulnerable um, go to seek help from a therapist and that therapist, he might be a doctor, might be a psychologist or a psychiatrist, or might be a lay therapist, has abused them. And, you know, you'll read those kind of tales in the newspapers. But the idea which is suggested, which is, you know, somebody sits down and they say, look into my eyes, look into my eyes, and, you know, and then they take advantage of them, is just utter nonsense. The kind of thing you see in a movie. There's no uh, validity to that. But it makes kind of interesting newspaper copy. But there isn't a single case of that uh, taking place in any psychological literature anywhere in the world. And the overwhelming um, evidence, and there's been thousands, tens of thousands of research studies done on hypnosis, the overwhelming evidence is that, it's, that number one, it works for behavioral changes, like quitting smoking, losing weight, becoming more confident. It's, it's actually the best technique for, for many things. Uh, and it's completely 100% safe, okay? So yes, vulnerable people get abused by awful abusive people. Um, and sometimes, you know, some of them have been doctors, some of them have been hypnotists, some of them have been police, some of them are accountants, you know, uh, but hypnosis in and of itself is is in no way whatsoever dangerous. It's completely safe. But where's the line then? I don't understand if you can make me dance around a sweeping brush believing it's the most beautiful woman that you couldn't make me do something illegal or at the worst extreme even kill somebody. Great. All right. Good question. Again, um, firstly, the people that are dancing around, you know, taking part in the horseplay um, they know that um, what they're doing, but it just feels like the most natural thing in the world to do. It's a bit like karaoke. You know that you're singing I Will Survive badly, but you have had a few drinks, you don't care. So what hypnosis does is it lowers inhibitions, but it doesn't take over somebody's mind to the point that they've got no control. I know it may seem that way, but it doesn't. Now, uh, when I ask somebody to do something that's um, on, on the stage, they've got the choice. They can, if it you know totally uh, goes against their morals or values they'll say no for example I asked a gentleman I've had this happen to me twice in all the years I've been doing it ask an Indian gentleman uh, you know when you wake up and you hear this piece of music you'll think you're Elvis he was doing all the other things in the show but suddenly the music starts he goes oh popped out of the trance I can't do this and I said why he went it's not it's forbidden in my culture I went oh okay well you know it's not in mine but I respect your belief sir and, the, and then moved on to another routine now uh, the CIA did a number of experiments and, and actually a number of other um, psychologists did um, in the 1950s to see if hypnosis could be a mind control weapon because it would have been very useful but uh, they found conclusively that people won't commit what they call antisocial acts that's the actual technical term for it, it means like going and killing someone um, just because they're hypnotized now you can manipulate and coerce and brainwash people into doing things that are not in their best interests and um, the people who do that on a regular basis are cults Politicians, salespeople, all get get us to do things that are not in our best interest, but in theirs. You know, for example, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I remember reading a quote by um, uh, Adolf Hitler. He said, "It's the good fortune of governments that people don't think." And Goebbels, his right hand man, said. Um, uh, most people don't want to go to war, but if you can, you can motivate anyone to go to war if you tell them they're under attack. So those are the kind of misuses that I think that we find. You know, when people say, "Well, that's not hypnosis," I go, "I consider politicians, cult leaders, salespeople, all of these people to be the everyday hypnotists." You could say that you know, teachers and parents are as well. We're conditioning our children, you know, in many good ways. You know, we're telling, we're teaching them how to read and write, and you know, to uh, you know, the sort of the the, the you know moral structure. And we're doing that through a process of conditioning. So conditioning, mind control is not a bad thing as such, you know, provided that it's used um, uh, in benevolent uh, ways. So where do we draw the line? Well, I think the, um, you know, that's, that's a personal issue, you know, um, 
But I think e equally, we also all know what's right and what's wrong. And um, what I try and do, and I think the vast majority of hypnotists try and do, is always give suggestions that are in everybody's best interests. You know, my suggestions are that people might want to change behaviours to help them live a bit longer, to have a more healthy life, to feel better in themselves. And also, I do a show where I get people to lose their inhibitions and do, you know, some stunts that are comedic, but never um, in an utterly humiliating way or anything like that. You know, and if you look at, say, some of the uh, morally reprehensible reality shows that are on now, hypnotism shows are quite tame compared to those. Could you hypnotise me now, Paul, even if I didn't want to be? Well, not really. I mean, it is possible, yes, um, to hypnotise you without... I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to change that answer. I'm going to say it is possible to hypnotise you without you realising. To and And by hypnosis I mean focus on one idea to the exclusion of all others right? Uh, to go into that lovely daydream but to then get you to do things that are fundamentally against your morals and values no so yes I can get you relaxed get you focused and I can also uh, open your mind to other possibilities so say you come to see me and you want to quit smoking or you want to lose weight I have to help you change the way that you've coded the behaviours in your unconscious mind so that you can so that you can take on new behaviors new perspectives but you know if i can just sit here and talk to you and say and you know when you wake up you know you'll go and rob a bank is that likely no that's not actually but if i was a nasty coercive you know m um, mind shagging cult then i could probably you know through a process of wearing you down and you know finding the emotional chinks in your armor you know get you to think it was a good idea to give all your money to the cult leader and work 20 hours a day for the you know the glory of the cult and you know convince you that the cult leader is in direct communication with god and all that sort of nonsense so do you see the difference between the two you know hypnosis um doesn't involve coercion it involves relaxation focusing on one idea to the exclusion of others letting go of the normal mindsets that we hold um you know in our everyday thinking and that can be done so that we can change your behavior or it can be done so that we can let go of our sort of inhibitions and you know take part of a bit of horseplay on the stage. Um, the other kind of um, behavioural change that I was talking about, which is highly coercive, is the type of cults, high-pressure salespeople and politicians engage in. What I don't understand, though, is how. How can you know all of this, yet we the masses have no idea what you're talking about? Well, uh, I have specialised in the last 20 years, Alex, in helping people make certain changes because I don't have all the answers. Crikey, I mean, you know, I have as many problems as everybody else. Problems are how you learn and grow. But I've made my life about several things. I, I'm, a, I'm an entertainer, but um, in parallel to that, um, and in fact, well, most of my time is spent running my self-improvement training company, which is probably the largest self-improvement training company in this country now. And, you know, I write books uh, uh, and make um, DVDs. And um, yes, it is a commercial venture for me, for me, but it's also what I feel passionate about. You know, some of my friends are, you know, passionate about, you know, something else and they make their life about that. You know, and we, we talk about this. It's funny, you know, I just can't seem to get excited about, uh, that excited about computers. Whereas, you know, a lot of my friends are so excited by the new operating software or, you know, what, how many RAM is in their computer. It just depends what you're driven by. Uh, you know, other friends of mine love horses. I think they're beautiful. They're fantastic. But, you know, they want to get to the stable and go riding and everything and all of that so just my passion is people and I particularly like working with people and helping them make changes. And what has happened in the last sort of 20, 30 years, in the same way that there's been terrific advances in, say, computer technology and telecommunications, um, there has also been in psychological techniques. I mean, once upon a time, a, a telephone was the size of a briefcase, and it was a mobile telephone, yeah? And it was very expensive, and it didn't do a lot of stuff, right? Now, everybody's got a cellular telephone. It's the size of a bar of chocolate and you can send video pictures on it's amazing now in the same way it used to take us six months to remove a phobia but now just about every single phobia in the world can be removed in less than an hour but there aren't enough people who know how to do it yet i'm training lots of people but you know that that's what we're actually up against so the technology exists for everyone to be cured of their phobias right now also you have a lot of nonsense to get through, right? Like, for example, recently the government gave millions of pounds to these white coats to go and research why people have phobias. 
I don't think we need to know why. What difference is that going to make? If you'd given me that £10 million, I could have gone and cured every phobia in this country. So, um, you know, the, one of the reasons that a lot of people don't know about the techniques that, um, that I'm using is because there is a bit of resistance to it because the system up until now worked in a particular way. For years, everyone was hung up on this thing called psychoanalysis, which, frankly, is rubbish and doesn't work. And, you know, it was invented by um, that pervert uh, Sigmund and Freud, uh, you know, who uh, was off his head most of the time, coming up with these bonkers theories, you know, about us wanting to sleep with our own mothers. Now, um, I take a much more pragmatic, uh, modern view of, of psychological change. I don't think we need to take somebody who feels very upset and keep asking them to recall all the big traumas of their life over and over again. That's like taking someone with a broken leg and throwing them down the stairs until they feel better. I think that um, uh, people at work kind of mechanically and so I'm interested in the process that they go through in their brain and in their body when they're doing something highly functional or dysfunctional. In your research have you found that if you press the right buttons on everybody you'll get the same reaction? Not entirely, no, we, 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 um, there, we are unique all of us but we all have the same fundamental structure in that we all we all um, have the same share the same neurology as human beings and physiology you know apart from like you know so there are some genetic differences but yeah sure we're all going to be different in our personalities and our beliefs and in in our unique skills and talents but we essentially all have the same kind of body and brain so and the same way of operating the software inside our mind and really that's what i'm like i'm a um, I'm like a computer programmer. So if somebody's overweight or they, you know, they want to quit smoking, they can't do, or, you know, they've got panic attacks or insomnia or they suffer from stress, they're not bad, wrong, broken. They've just got bad, they've got faulty programming. And I rewrite, overwrite the operating software of their brain so that they become more functional. That's why I'm able to get these astounding success rates with helping people lose weight and so on, is because I'm not trying to analyze why it is that they're overweight. What I'm doing is I'm looking at how it is that they've created that pattern and I go and change it. I spoil the old pattern and install a new pattern. That's all it is. I've seen you on so many TV shows get people, for example, who can't stand snakes or tarantulas, mm. and they won't even come within 100 feet of them. The next minute, within an hour, you come back and they're happy to hold them. Yeah. Now, have you just put them in some kind of trance? Is this just a momentary thing that they're able to do that, or is this for the rest of their lives? Well, in most cases, it will be for the rest of their lives. You see, we're only born hardwired with two fears, which is the fear of sudden loud noises or the fear of falling. All the other fears are learned. Therefore, they can be unlearned. I'll give you an example of how phobias are learned. Um, the most common fear and phobia in the Western world right now is the fear of public speaking. And the way that we uh, all get that nicely installed is at school. Stand up, read in front of the class, and I'll point out every mistake you make uh, in front of everyone else so you can feel uh, worthless again and again and again. And so, inadvertently, many well-intentioned teachers are actually making us scared to speak in public. You, you know, you don't feel scared speaking in front of your friends because you know they're not going to harshly negative negatively judge you you know they're going to laugh or support you or you know give you encouragement and so what I do is I take feelings of power and confidence um, and I create if you like a psychological switch for that and I get somebody to think of the thing that scares them and yet I switch on the confidence simultaneously and it wipes out the old feelings of fear and installs a new feeling of confidence it's like overwriting the operating software of the brain so does this knowledge that you have come from years of research putting that together or is this a unique thing that you you've come up with I, I've taken the best um, fr from the best people and incorporated it into to some extent it's you know my, my own particular style but I actually use a technology which is developed by I think the world's greatest living behavioral scientist dr. Richard Bandler he created a technology called NLP it stands for neuro linguistic programming and NLP is used by every government in the world by every major corporation uses NLP um, lots of educational institutions NLP is everywhere NLP P neurolinguistic programming, neuro referring to brain, neurology, linguistic, obviously language and programming like a computer has programs, so does a human being. So in order to shake hands or um, write a letter, boil an egg, make a million pounds, you have got to rely on the programs inside your body that enable you to do all the things that you'd 
that you do in your everyday life. And the way that you communicate with yourself and others is important in that, um, in that whole setup. So basically, everything we do comes down to our neuro-linguistic programming. And I know it sounds highly technical, that term, uh, but it's incredibly simple when you actually read it. Anyone who's read my book, Change Your Life in Seven Days, most of the principles in that book are, are you know, I've taken Richard's work um, and his NLP models, and I've made them... Um, I think simple hopefully and easy to understand so you know it's my way of putting it but essentially I I'm you know I'm using a lot of Richard's work yeah are you using hypnosis to resolve these problems or is it another technique well I'm using both um, I, I have some very simple uh, practical rules you know principles that p anyone can follow them they're so easy a monkey could follow them but in addition to reinforce the new patterns of behavior, the new uh, ways of thinking and acting in the world, I use hypnosis because it's proven to be the best psychological technique for behavioral change. Let's start with weight then. Can you help somebody that really doesn't want it themselves? Or does your technique override the lack of willpower that a person may have? Well, you know, I think it's always got to come from you um, because... If you don't have the motivation to ask for help or to do something, then it's going to be an uphill struggle. And that really is, is, is half of the, um, is half, I was going to say the battle, but it's not quite a battle. It's, it's half of what's required is for you to go, do you know what, I'm going to do something. So I, people come up to me from time to time, they say, I want you to make me stop smoking. And I go, God, I bet you do. I bet you'd like me to make all your decisions for you. <laughs> yeah. Take responsibility. <laughs> I say, I can help you. I can take away the cravings. I can make it so that cigarettes um, don't seem so important. But you've got to make that decision you're going to quit. Otherwise, you're just going to go back to it. And they go, oh, but I I thought, I go, yeah, I know you thought. No, I'm sorry, you have to have some say in it. I'm a believer in give a man a fish, he eats for a day. Teach a man to fish, he eats for life. So many of my techniques are aimed at actually helping people to get more responsibility, get more control of their lives. You know, learn to... Uh, to understand the wisdom of what their body's telling them when, say, say overeating is a, a, a perfect example. Once we t tune into our body's um, natural... Um, intelligence and signaling it's very difficult to overeat and that's what i do so is it you just pressing my buttons to make me want to do it more than before well that's you first of all with regard to being overweight that's absolutely true yeah it's it's eating too much and not exercising and i would say this um it's not just pushing buttons it's looking at what i do is i made a study a few years ago of people who are overweight versus people who are naturally thin and i watched lots of different things and i noticed a curious thing People who are overweight, uh, first of all, um, they think about food um, all the time, right? Um, and, well, actually, what, what the, this, uh, I tell you what the four golden rules are. Let me do it like this. The, if you want to lose weight, it's very, very simple. And this works for most people most of the time. Number one, when you are hungry, go and eat. I'm always meeting people who tell me, they go, I'm on this fabulous diet. I go, come back and tell me about it in six months. Well, I'm still waiting for anyone to come back because they never work. If there was a real a diet that actually worked, they would just be a diet and everyone to stick to it. But, you know, there's one along every six months and then another celebrity to endorse it, you know, and it's just nonsense. They don't work. And, and you know what they start to do now? There are loads of them that start by going, this is not just another diet book. And then 100 pages of recipes. <laughs> it's utter nonsense. So, first of all, dieting not... Not only it would be it, w it would be bad enough if it didn't work, but actually it's far worse than that. Dieting makes people fat because when you when you starve yourself, your metabolism slows down. Your body thinks there's a famine on. It goes into survival mode, so it actually stores fat in the cells. It's the worst thing you can do. It makes you subconsciously tense around food. So whatever you do when you're hungry, go and eat. And the other thing is, some people go, well, it's all because I'm um, it's the chocolate that does it. No, 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 look. If you want a particular kind of food, have it. Now, if you make a food forbidden, you will crave it and it will become so, you'll, you know, it'll be so much more important to you. So I say to people, be, already when I've said these two golden rules, people are going, oh, you're having a laugh, mate. What? Eat when I'm hungry, eat what I want. Nah, you see, the third rule, and this is the kernel of the system is, the curious thing about people who are overweight is they think about food all the time 
except when they're actually eating it. And then what they do is they shovel food in as fast as they can. Now there's a reason for this. When we eat, we release a, a happy chemical, neurotransmitter inside our brains called serotonin, which makes us feel good, makes us feel high in fact. And so this is why people that are overweight shovel food in as fast as they can, because they're getting high from the serotonin. But because they're going at it like the clappers, they can't hear the signal from their tummy that tells them that they're full. So they eat way past the, the point where they should actually stop because they're satisfied and it's only when suddenly that they've absolutely stuffed themselves they feel fat and bloated that they stop so they feel so guilty about that they go and do the whole thing again two or three hours later now the very very simple thing you can do is when you're hungry go and eat eat what you want not what you think you should but this is it this is the kernel of the system and people go it can't be that easy i know you think that weight loss is difficult because you've been brainwashed by dieting to think it is it's actually easy 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 put the knife and fork down between mouthfuls. Prize your fingers off the sandwich and put <laughs> your hands down. Put the sandwich down. Instead of trying to shovel as much in, if you slow your eating speed down to a quarter, it feels a bit weird at first, but you soon get used to it, and consciously enjoy each mouthful like a gourmet. You know, imagine your French. Sit there, mmm, mmm, <laughs> noticing the textures and the tastes. When you do that, suddenly, your whole experience of food changes because people who watch TV or read a magazine while they're shoveling away their food go unconscious. They're not paying attention to their body. They can't hear that signal, that all important signal from their tummy that tells them they're full. So they eat more than they should. So their stomach becomes larger so they can eat more the next time and more the next time and so on until they become fatter and fatter. Now, when they stop, and they slow the process down, and they really pay attention to the to, to the how the food tastes, the texture, and everything. First of all, it tastes better, but secondly, you can actually hear that signal from your tummy going, "I'm satisfied." At that moment, stop, even if your plate is half full. And people go, "Well, that's weird." I go, "Only at the moment it is. For a naturally thin person, it isn't." And they go, "But." Uh, you mean, what if I'm hungry 10 minutes later again? Well, if you're hungry, go and eat again, provided you, you chew each mouthful consciously and deliberately, and when you think you're full, stop. Now, people go, it can't be this easy. Friend of mine, I did this with him a few years ago. He lost four and a half stone in six months. My tour manager's just, just done it. He's, he said, I want to come to one of your seminars. I said, I'm going to tell you the process over the phone. He went, all right. And I told him the process. He's lost a stone and a half in about two months. You know, and I'm just, I can't tell you. If you look in, you see in my book, I Can Make You Thin, the testimonials. Maureen Edwards lost 18 stone using this system. She'd been overweight all her life. She's in her 40s. So people go, oh, it's all right for the youngsters. But us people have been doing it for years. No, 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 no. You're conning yourself. Look, please, you can, as far as I'm concerned, you can lie to everyone else. Don't lie to yourself. Really dangerous stuff. You know, the number of people who are overweight that will sit there at dinner and, you know, have a perfectly civilized small meal with everyone else, then go home and ram cream cakes, you know, as fast as they can down uh, and feel ashamed about it. All they need to do is to get my book or come to one of the trainings, and I promise you the chances of you succeeding are extremely high, much higher than they are on these rubbish diets. You know, seven times more likely to succeed with my system than any other system in the world right now. So me being a fatty then really is my mother's fault for making me clear me plate. Oh, that's absolutely the clean plate club. I'd like it to be illegal. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's terrible. My mum and dad used to say this. They go, oh, it's starving people in Ethiopia. I go, and me being overweight helps helps them how you know it's nonsense you're absolutely right you yeah you want to leave food on your people go ah oh, but it's wasting it look the moment the chicken is cooked it's wasted where do you want that chicken on your backside or on your plate look if you are hungry go and eat tell your body there will always be enough food so it doesn't need to slow the metabolism it doesn't need to be in survival mode eat it slowly consciously really taste it and then as soon as you even suspect your full stop and i guarantee if you follow those principles you cannot not lose weight by the way my friend who lost the four and a half stone he didn't do a, a single bit of formal exercise he didn't go to the gym because you see a lot of people think that exercise means you know running on a track the average british man takes about 6000 steps a day the average british woman about 5000 somebody who's overweight takes only 2000 less steps that's about a 15 20 minute walk right four city blocks so all you have to do is walk a little bit more each day and you're doing and that's good exercise by the way you're doing the same amount of exercise as somebody who's not overweight and suddenly when you put it like that people go 
oh, I could do that. I go, I know you can. You know, a lot of people I know are really thin. They don't do any formal exercise, but they're rushing about all day because their metabolism's fast because they're, they're not slowing it down by starving themselves on some stupid diet. And so what I'm saying to you is exercise can be easy. You know, a lot of people I know at the beginning of the year, they go, right, that's it. I've been a sinful, evil person. I've eaten too much at Christmas. I must punish myself by going to the gym. And they get to the gym and it's too much like hard work. They pack it in after a week and they go, oh, it's not for me. It's for those thin people. Duh! It's not at all. It's just a state of mind. And moving on to something slightly different, you can help people who stutter. People who stutter don't breathe in the same way that people who speak normally do. And what, I mean, it, it, it's a number of things, but that's really at the base of it. What uh, pe people who stutter do is they breathe all the way out, forget to breathe. I mean, try it now, you know, just go, <sighs> breathe out. And then, then try and talk, and you, you feel like you want to stutter. So what I do is I get people to surf the breath because... Um, when you've got that surf going on, it's very easy to speak continuously without, you know, seemingly having to stop for long. And in addition to that, people who stutter also have linked to lots of fear to the idea of stuttering, so it becomes inevitably a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I teach them the, the appropriate breathing patterns. I also show them how they can overcome it by um, by creating more confidence. And, and I do it really quickly. I did a stutterer the other day, and this guy he's about 80 percent better he still stutters a little bit you know but 80 percent improvement and it took me an hour and so these people that go to the society where they have to spend a year you know i say forget that there is i mean it's very nice these well-intentioned people who want to help you so it's all lovely but there are techniques now that can help you significantly reduce your stuttering in a very short space of time and finally, they're moving on to the biggest curse of our society, smoking. I can't bear it. I can't stand it. I can't understand why people would want to kill themselves when the facts are so obvious. Again, though, if they don't want to stop, they're not going to, are they? It doesn't matter how many patches or pills you take. You've got to want to stop. Yeah, that's right. They do have to want to. The reason that people smoke is it gives quite a powerful change in feelings. Uh, when we smoke, a, when someone smokes a cigarette, they get a release of endorphins, the body's natural opiates. Now, there are a lot of good ways to get endorphins outside of smoking you know physical exercise does that you know anything you know highly pleasurable i'm sure you know what i'm talking about <laughs> gives a release of endorphins but also you know appreciating um uh nice things you know a beautiful summer's day when you're walking down the street you feel so good you're getting a little release of endorphins there so smokers have you really used cigarettes to give themselves artificial highs uh from the crude chemicals in a cigarette often to control their stress it's just a really crude stress control mechanism now i don't have any moral stance on this i think if people want to smoke it should be their own business if people want to eat mud it should be their own business i'm not on some crusade to stop people however i have to say that that i agree with you there are serious health risks with smoking you know it's i don't consider it a very sensible functional choice but you know we all do things from time to time that are not that sensible i tried smoking when i was about 12 years old behind the bike sheds and coughed and splutter and thought Good God, this is awful. You know, even though I want to be like the other tough guys in the school, I don't think I'll be doing that. Um, so it doesn't appeal to me, but I can see why people do it. And increasingly, people want to stop. And, you know, I'm quite happy to help people stop. I mean, sometimes people have asked me to help them uh, to, um, to quit, say, alcohol. Or some people say, I just want to be able to have one drink and stop. And so, again, I don't bring any moral judgment to it. You know, I help them do just, you know, as much as they want to. So I see my job as a facilitator, really. You know, I mean, I, I couldn't do something I felt morally opposed to, I think. You know, I think it would be difficult to do that. In fact, poss impossible, really, for me. But, you know, if people want to smoke, I think it's the own business however if they want to quit i've got some very good techniques to help them you've had an amazing life and an amazing career so far you've done arena tours you've been on broadway uh, you've even been on the show of one of my heroes howard stern oh, you yeah. do his show now he's an interesting guy because if you've read his book he suffers with ocd this obsessive compulsive disorder syndrome that seems to be sweeping the country and the world yeah. everybody's talking about this do you help with people like that oh, as well yeah 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 if you've got ocd then definitely get in touch with us we'd love to have you on the show you know um i i i really quite like doing the ocd cases they're fascinating I went out for dinner with a friend of mine last Tuesday and she locked the door twice on the car. Yeah. And when she opened it, she opened it twice. And I said, why are you doing that? Oh, I have to do that. When I turn the lights off, I turn them on, turn them off, turn them on, turn them off to turn them off. Yeah. yeah. Where does that come from? Well, it's, um, it's just a bad habit. And, you know, they're not mad, bad, broken. It's just a bad habit. I mean, I, I've seen all kinds of cases of this. You know, somebody who had to polish every light switch 
you know, had to polish the sink. You know, there couldn't be any little tiny specks of dirt or smears anywhere. You know, some people have to, you know, sit down. They have to get up and touch the fridge ten times and things like this. It's that human be- human beings um, work a bit like a computer, and sometimes a bit of the software in our minds is a bit faulty, and that's all it is. And it can be rewritten very easily using techniques like hypnosis and some of the other modern psychological techniques that I employ. 